Welcome to another video coverage of This Week on Rails. I'm Dave Kumira, and today we have a lot of updates provided by Zach. Again, I don't create the newsletter that goes out, I simply provide this video coverage of it. So if you'd like to receive your own copy, or if you want to view it online, you can go to world.hey.com forward slash this.week.in.rails, or now there is a new redirect URL, which you can go to rubyonrails.org forward slash newsletter, and it'll just point you back to that same location. So let's go ahead and dive into today's topics. For the first item, add debug gem back to the gem file template. And this is something where there was a bug in the debug gem and we wanted the Rails main to be stable, so it was removed for a period of time. But with the release of Ruby 3.2.2, which happened today or yesterday, depending on when you're watching this or maybe a few days ago, then that issue has been resolved, so it's been added back into the main branch. And for the next one, infer foreign key when inverse of is present. And that basically means that when you're using inverse of in an association, whether it's a has one or has many, then it's going to automatically infer what the foreign key is. So you don't have to manually specify it. And this is going to be backwards compatible. So if you are already explicitly setting the foreign key when using inverse of, then nothing's going to change. For example, if you have an inverse of book, and then it's going to automatically infer the foreign key being the book ID. But if you are deviating from that, then you would still need to specify what the foreign key is. Next, we have an update to the action cable assert broadcast to return the messages that were broadcasted. And this is really going to help around testing, just so you can make sure that you are broadcasting the messages that you were expecting. And next, we have another update to active storage, and this around the direct uploads when using a JavaScript library or framework. So if you're using React or Angular or Vue to do your direct uploads, then you can sometimes run into some problems. Because a normal Rails application has a cookie-based session, when you are using a JavaScript library like React and that's separated from your Rails application, and your Rails app is running in an API-only mode, then you're not really going to be able to do that. Instead, you would use some kind of authorization header or similar. And so with this update, you are getting that functionality where you can essentially pass in some kind of authentication header and pass that into direct upload and then it'll work properly as you would expect. And next, we have an update to the number to human size and that's adding the zettabyte. And while it's a small change, it is appreciated because it's just future proofing a bit because I'm sure as we get beyond the terabytes and petabytes, then with the exabytes and zettabytes, we're going to be needing that kind of conversion. But I think we're still several years off of that in most normal cases. And for the next one, we are getting a security update where we set the character set in the content type response headers, and this is OWASP related. And the really interesting thing about this pull request is if we look at the top sentence, an issue was raised during a pen test that the content type header is missing the character set in some responses. And the really cool thing about this is that I'm assuming that this was an independent pen test that was done on an application that this person was running. And when the issue was raised, instead of just fixing it or adding it into their application, it came back into the Rails core, where Simon made his first pull request in the Rails repository. And so that's just one of the wonderful things about open source that we can all contribute to it in various ways. And next, we got another active storage update. And this is just removing the mini mime usage in favor of Marshall. And I'm really big on this because I don't like adding dependencies if I don't have to. And the fewer dependencies I have to worry about, then I think the more maintainable my application will be from a Rails upgrade perspective. And this is something that I always weigh whenever I am bringing in an external dependency is, is this gem while it's maintained today, is it going to be maintained long term? And if it's not maintained long term, am I willing to take on that responsibility? And while I'm not saying to avoid gems entirely, all I'm saying is that we want to make a conscious decision whenever we are adding gems into our gem file and make sure that we're not doing something that we could easily implement and maintain ourselves just to save a few seconds of time. And next, we have a quality of life improvement. It is a bug fix where the Rails generate index name being too long. And I've had this issue so many times in the past, and I'm so glad to see that someone has created a patch for this. So if you are using MySQL, PostgreSQL, or SQLite, and if you have a long index name, which is automatically generated, 
then it's limited to 62 characters. And that's not even a Rails issue, it's just a limitation of the indexes. So before, if you were creating an index on a table, and if it was going to be a really long index name, then you could end up in a situation where you got an error because the name generated was too long, and this is a fix for that. And so this is a much welcome change. And next, we're getting an optimization to the Marshall dump and Marshall load for the active record base, and we can expect about a 200% performance increase with this. And that performance increase is in comparison to Rails 6.1 versus 7.1. And next, we're getting an update for the action text, encrypted rich text, and this is around the load hooks. And if we look at the guides for the source engines, these are the load hooks you can use in your own code. And simply before, we had the action text record and action text rich text, but now it's also supporting the action text encrypted rich text. And next, there is a provider job ID that's being added for backburner jobs. And it looks like that's going to be for the Beanstalk Active Job Queue Adapter then this is providing a way that you can pass in the provider job ID to then delete a job. And next we have an update for the Rails help, where it's only going to list the framework and plugin commands. Anything that's defined in the lib tasks and it's a rake file, it's no longer going to be included. You would have to call the rake-t to get those options. And next we have an update in the readmes in the main framework pages of the API documentation. And while this isn't changing the actual documentation, it's just changing the visibility of it. So before, a lot of the library modules had empty descriptions in the API docs, and now they're going to have the relevant information, so it's a nice improvement. And next, we're getting an alias for accept, and that is without. So whichever one clicks in your brain better when working with partials, if you wanted to exclude a certain attribute, then you now have that ability of both options, whether using the existing except, or now you can do without. Next, we're getting some consistency to our Rails documentation, and that's adding the markdown lint to the guides, and also the RuboCop markdown snippets. And so this is great because it's gonna bring consistency to the documentations, also without having to manually review every change that comes in. Next, allowing destroy variants. And this can be useful in cases when a file upload fails. So you could get into a situation where that variant record exists, but the upload file is missing. And so now we have an API to then delete that variant. And next, when an attachable is missing, whether it's because a user was deleted or some other situation, the partial action text attachables missing attachable was called. So now a custom partial can be rendered on a per model basis. And the way that's going to look, if we look at the pull request, in a user model, for example, you could call a class method to missing attachable partial path, and you can specify the string of the missing attachable partial. You would then create your own partial in that path, and then you can render out whatever you wanted. And so over the past week, there are 34 contributors to the Rails code base. So I wanna thank everyone, especially those first time contributors who have helped make Rails better. And so I want to thank everyone who has contributed to Rails over this past week. Well, that's all for this week's video coverage of This Week in Rails. Thanks for watching.